morning. Um, so we're going to get started here and I will answer whatever questions I can. We're going to approach this as uh, collaboratively, like try to put our heads together and figure out what actually happened in multiple places. This was a big, big uh, day in news. And um, some days it's like uh, there's almost nothing to talk about other than rehashing things. And other days it's too much. And yesterday was one of those too much days, starting with 151 um, missiles and or drones and or whatever else was shot into Ukraine. Jake Bro did a really good job of breaking down what was actually knocked down. And it was mostly drones and so uh, mostly missiles that got through. And that was a bad day. And then uh, we had the oil refinery bit where we had, do we have the, uh, um, so they had been hitting all these oil refineries and you had the Financial Times article about the oil refineries, but we only had one of source. Everything, all the other news stories came from the Financial Times story. And so you're like, oh, okay, that's a little... Um, Cheryl, hello, Cheryl, you're, you're here. Um, I don't have moderators here. So Cheryl, um, if you repost something from somebody else that you think is a really good question, I'll try to, uh, make sure that I catch that. If that's okay, Cheryl, just, just give me a thumbs up if that's all right. Um, if you, if you see something that I'm, I'm missing that needs to be re, uh, uh, you know, make sure we address it. Um, I, I just I want to answer your questions and I'm also going to try to interact with your questions because I don't I don't have all the answers. OK, so um, Cheryl, if you heard me, if you can give me a thumbs up, I'd appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really all that talented at live streaming. So um, so then we had the Financial Times story. Then we had the um, what was going on in the United States with the um, Marjorie Taylor Greene putting in the the motion to vacate, but it's not really there yet, but it's kind of dangling over uh, the speaker's head. And then we had um, uh, the Moscow terrorist incident. And, and as far as, uh, how do you, how do you address me? Um, yeah, it's uh, Professor Dash Gerdes, at Professor Dash Gerdes, G-E-R-D-E-S. Uh, okay. So I was just, she's asked, how do you, would you address? Um, anyway, um, yeah, so a lot of things were happening yesterday simultaneously. Um, okay, so tell me what your questions are because I, we can, <laughs> we can attack in any direction and go. So uh, question, should Ukraine take out a Russian power grids as well? Um so they can, but I don't think that's as useful. And I don't think it is right. Right's not maybe the correct word for that. When, when Russia is taking out the Ukrainian power grids, uh, okay, Goose just came up and I'll answer that question next. Um, when Russia is taking out the power grids in Ukraine, it's going after the civilian population. Is there a power grid near a military base that can be taken out or something? That would seem to have be more virtuous or more right. I wouldn't go tit for tat with being evil, but taking out the uh, oil refineries is absolutely brilliant. Okay, Goose Springsteen says, do higher global energy prices increase the likelihood of Trump winning? If so, isn't it sensible for Ukraine to refrain from striking Russian refineries until after the election? So uh, that question is prompted by the last paragraph of the Financial Times article, which, are, well, there's another uh, paragraph in there talking about how Biden wants lower prices, but there's two places in that article where they talked about how... Um, you know, the Biden doesn't want this to happen, not during an election year. OK, it, it went up four percent for 14. Um, let's say that they can knock out half of Russia's uh, refining power. Uh, so what I'm saying is it, it uh, the gas prices went up four percent for 14. Let's let's use five and 15 just for a rough cut. Right. So you multiply that three times. If gas goes up by 12%, will that elect Trump? No, but it will 
take away hundreds of billions of dollars from Russia's bottom line, that seems uh, like a good deal. I don't think that's going to elect Trump in and of itself. I think, I think uh, other factors may cause Trump to be elected. I don't know if that's the case or if that if that will or won't won't be. But it won't be because Ukraine took out oil and that caused gas prices to rise marginally. That's that's my estimation. I, I could be wrong, but I hope that answers your question. Okay, could the acts of Marjorie Taylor Greene set another third Republican to resign that would help the uh, bill to get uh, to get to Ukraine? <laughs> the my party has really pantsed itself in the last six months. I mean, I know some people are going to be saying like, wow, your party's been bad for years. Sure. You can, you can believe that. That's fine. That's, that doesn't bother me at all. But in the, what they've done since the McCarthy removal has just been catastrophic to the party. Um, like Democrats couldn't hurt the party as much as Republicans have hurt the party. Um, okay. So, uh, could it, Yes, I mean, could uh, I, I don't know that another one's going to get there. I know that's a great hope uh, that Democrats have is that another another one or two we're going to because they have like a one person margin at this point. If another one or two go, it's it's almost guaranteed to go to the Democrats, and they don't want to do that more than they want to do anything else. Okay, Cheryl just posted. I've been hearing most Russian refined oil is used internally, very little sold externally. Yes, that is correct, Cheryl. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm answering Cheryl extra cause she's finding other questions here that she's going to help me repost. Cause I don't have a moderator cause I never even knew until recently that you were supposed to have moderators. Um, <laughs> this, this isn't what I do in life. This is just like on the side here. Right. Um, so yes, and this happened before this happened last year, uh, domestic oil, it was, um, Russian oil was for a time, uh, restricted to just domestic oil, so particularly so farmers could be able to farm so they could get their grain crop out and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Domestic oil being restricted is not new, but it is, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but that they had to have a bill to restrict it from export was pretty significant. And if you can't even get, so let's say if, if you can strike the oil, and uh, pre prevent export, that's good. But if you can strike the oil while it's even being restricted to domestic consumption, and then they can't get not just the export money, but the grain out, um, like the, it'll keep the farm, like it, either the farmers will get it or there'll be mass lines in the streets in, you know, I know there's di a difference between diesel and gas and that kind of thing, but, or, you know, have that kind of effect on Russia. That's either way is a powerful way of approaching it. Um, somebody said something about the, um, with the oil, did, did, uh, the white house really do that? I don't know. And I don't know because, I, or, you know, try to direct them not to not to do these strikes. I don't know because we only have the one Financial Times article. One of my uh, viewers that I email with regularly uh, about some important things is uh, pointed that out. Like we only have the one I can only find the one Financial Times article. I can't find any other source. And I'm like, that's a, that's a really interesting point. You can. <laughs> right. OK. Um, okay, let's get on to other questions. Uh, why is the EU still buying Russian grain? That's a great question. Why are they still buying Russian grain? Um, now, I know that they're working on a, some kind of a sweetheart deal for Ukrainian grain for the EU food um, program, uh, but I'm not sure that that's a great question. All throughout, uh, this is Alt Drab, who just popped up. All throughout the past two major wars and even some others, the U.S. loaned money and equipment to Britain, France and Russia to which they had to repay. Why are people opposed to Trump's plan? It it feels bad to just say, um, well, we're not going to, to give you the things that you need. And there feels like there's a moral component here, too, because of the Budapest Memorandum, where we kind of seem like whether there's anything binding or not we kind of seem to have have um, implied look if you give up your nukes we'll protect your borders now russia apparently 
didn't really care about that. And they're the ones actually causing the problem. Britain and the United States have. But any way you can do it to get them the weapons that they need right now is is of the most importance, whether it's a loan that probably won't get repaid or a gift or whatever. I, anyway, it just needs to be done because they're struggling just because they don't have the weapons with, with which to fight. And the fascinating thing is that the Ukrainians want to fight. Look at Afghanistan, didn't want to fight. Look at um, Iraq, didn't want to fight. Look at Vietnam, didn't want to fight. I mean, like it was like pulling teeth to get President Zim in uh, in Vietnam or, or uh, Karzai, Karzai in uh, Afghanistan or whatever to like have the kind of will that the Ukrainians just have in spades. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry you got bumped, Cheryl. Um, I'll, I'm still looking for your questions primarily. I'll answer others along the way, but I'll um, look for yours first and foremost if you're uh, uh, kind enough to do that. John says, can you please explain to the viewers what will happen if the U.S. doesn't support Ukraine sooner because it will end up with U.S. troops and EU troops on the ground sooner? I don't know that it will, but it's a greater possibility. Um, or... If there aren't U.S. troops or EU troops there, then there's also a greater possibility that Russia just takes more and we just go, well, they took it. We didn't want to fight. I mean, we have a, a real uh, pre-World War II vibe in a like, no, we don't want any any bad thing to happen. Um, uh, so, I, I, yeah, I don't know what what to make of that. It, it could be it could be very, very bad if we just deny that we have a, a leadership role, which is what we seem to be doing. Um, Ronnie Vrigan says, uh, what's the link to ISIS and Russia getting attacked in Syria? Uh, is it Syria? I don't know. And so you, you got, you all tell me what you, what you think. So that ISIS said, um, uh, you know, that they took responsibility for this thing was very surprising to me because I was like, ISIS, really? I mean, so Greg Terry connected the dots for me in a text yesterday before we went on Mercado and talked about the same thing. And the building that was hit was actually a building that was related to a guy that was kind of chummy with Trump where they had the Miss Universe or something in Moscow. Like, is that poking Trump in the eye? I, I, I don't I just don't know. I mean, it's just it's too um, there are interesting things that I don't know are connected. And, and trying to connect things like my first gut instinct was wrong. My first, well, I don't know what it's wrong, but it seems like it might've been wrong. My first gut instinct was, um, uh oh, uh oh, is this a false flag? And that's because I've, I'm so steeped in way of seeing things and our frameworks can deceive us, right? Like we we're used to seeing a certain way. And that's why I went out of my way a few times to say, this could be this. I don't know. We don't have the facts. It might be. But we don't know. <laughs> so I have to keep saying we don't know. So whenever you are inclined to see something a particular way, you have to check yourself because my inclination was working against me. Um, what will happen if the, the Nipro dam breaks with the nuclear power plant collapse as well as become the next nuclear disaster? That is possible. But I don't know that hitting it with a rocket was going to do it. Um, I mean, when the other one broke... I believe it was from the inside. That's, as I understand, it. it's really, really difficult to blow a dam. Uh, so, uh, Cheryl, I'm sorry you're having such a hard time there. I don't know why that keeps doing that to you. I, I'm sorry, and I, I'm not competent enough to change anything about it. Um, so, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, okay, Martin says, I'm from Belgium. We have over... 200 billion euro in Russian assets frozen in a bank near Brussels. Our, uh, we are now using the interest to support Ukraine, but why can't we just confiscate it all and donate it? Because it's not your money um, and you would destroy the banking system. And I think cooler heads have finally prevailed on this. I know people don't like that answer, but if you weren't where you are in supporting Ukraine, you would say, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, you're correct. If you just take a step back from this, if you seize this money in the banking system, no one will ever trust the banking system again, because what if I'm on the other side of that equation of something that you don't like? So you can't go and do that. 
Um, so, but seizing the interest, I think was the way that they split the difference and kind of had some satisfaction from it without actually destroying the system. And, and that would have destroyed the system far more effectively than anything that Putin could have done to destroy the Western banking system. Okay. Goose Springsteen again says, I fear Ukraine won't mobilize more men until it's too late because it's politically unpopular. What do you think? Seems Ukraine's aims and commitments are mismatched from a domestic point of view. Yeah, they're they're really in a tension here uh, of mobilization and they know that they need to do it and they don't want to do it. And they keep having this problem of, well, we're running out of guys. We need to have more guys because we don't have the ability to rotate. We're, you know, every time we lose some, we're not making it up in the same way. Um, Russia is emptying jails in order to do that. And while, you know, people in jail from jail are not the best fighters, they they're fighting enough to try to survive, even if they're not trained well, and they don't mind the meat wave attacks. Cause it's, it's kind of, it's kind of immorally genius to, for what the Russians did. Somebody that's, that's a phrase somebody, um, a viewer gave me some time ago. I remember distinctly cause I was at my son's basketball game and I was really just, flipping through some waiting for them to come back out and play and flipping through the questions I said, yeah, it's kind of genius to do that with the, with the uh, prisoners. I mean, if you, you don't have to pay for them anymore anyway. And like, if you have no morals um, and so they're doing that sort of thing, the Ukrainians just don't have the same, I mean, it's a three to one um, outmatched. So they have to fight smarter rather than match them that way. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, crap. That makes it difficult. Anthony Wilson. Are, regarding Marjorie Taylor Greene's ticket to oust Johnson, is she the only person who can actually start the vote on that? So for this one, with what she just put in, it's not on the floor yet. She submitted it to be submitted to the floor at the time of her choosing. So she's like, it's like the sword of Damocles hanging over Mike Johnson's head. If you don't do what we tell you, this is going to fall on you. That's, that's what she's doing. Um, it as much, it's, it's more potent as a threat than actually as an action. I don't know that the Republicans will do this to Johnson now because they have essentially another person's just uh, leaving um, another I'm trying to remember the representative is just leaving from um, uh, the Republican side of the aisle and that leaves a majority of like one like they the Republicans have just destroyed themselves in the last six months um, and that is making it very very bad um, so yeah I, I don't think that it's going to happen, but if it did happen, Republicans would have to immediately unify behind whoever it is or lose a speakership and lose control of the agenda. And they know that and they they don't have the margin to be stupid like they had before, if that makes sense. And, and they've been pretty stupid here. Will Marjorie Taylor Greene's action give Moscow Mike Democrats support and leverage. Now, the fascinating thing about this story is Democrats are saying that they'll support Mike Johnson. What? Um, I, I, I mean, it hurts my head. I, I'm having a hard time. Like I watched the whole interview yesterday with Marjorie Taylor Greene afterwards. Um, hey, let me ask you something. Can, I, I'm wondering if you guys can hear this because I can play this little clip of Marjorie Taylor Greene um, talking if this helps at all. Um, and let me see if I can find that. Can, can you hear this if I play it? Can you hear that? Audio not can hear fine. No. Okay. Well, uh, so some of you can hear it, and some some of you cannot. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, but I watched your whole thing, and she actually, it's weird. She made some points <clears throat> that I agreed with, and like, so the speaker shouldn't have put this out within seventy, you know, without giving them seventy-two hours to read this thousand page bill and they shouldn't they, like 
like they complain about the other side of the aisle doing that and they're being forced to it. Like if you just take a step back from this whole thing, it's kind of like the, um, the, the seizing money from that that's frozen. If you take a step back from this issue, you'll look at it and go, you know, your, your primary job is to keep the government running. And because you're distracted with all these other things, you're not doing your primary job. And so she has a right to be angry with them. And the bill has chock full of stuff that are priorities from the other side that they shouldn't want because this side of the aisle doesn't want what that side of the aisle wants. And this side of the aisle doesn't want what that side of the aisle wants. Right. So she's right about those kind of things. But to put like, I, I don't know who to root for. I, I feel like this in so many ways. Well, uh, uh, Moscow terrorist attack and ISIS. <laughs> I, I'm not rooting for Moscow. I'm not rooting for ISIS. What Marjorie Taylor Greene or Johnson? I, I, I mean, it's it's just it's befuddling. It's just so very strange. Okay. Um, all right. Next, uh, Chris. Oh wait, uh, there's another one that just popped up. Uh, do anti NATO Republicans? Consider the risk of global nuclear pro proliferation loss of U.S. Uh, economic hegemony if the U.S. pulls back from their alliances. I think they they don't. So when you say anti-NATO Republicans, I think you're talking about like uh, isolationists or like get us out of NATO, that kind of something. Um, I don't think they're thinking about it that hard. I think the more serious you are in thinking about what's happening in the world, the less you tend to have a a stance like that. Um, and so I know, and when you say U S hegemony, just imagine, so that's, 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 that's the kind of language that the, the Russians tend to use is the hegemonic West. Um, but just imagine like if the United States Navy withdrew its presence from around the world, how free trade would seize up immediately because the local warlords or uh, other dictators who had other ambitions regionally would immediately make it untenable to be able to buy, sell, and trade without having to pass through their gateways. Um, and so we, we just don't think in those kinds of, of uh, processes. Cheryl, you said it's simple, vote straight blue, stop the dysfunction. It's not that simple because every uh, all my other priorities in life, um, economically or, or uh, socially, are uh, on the Republican side, I, I have to give up that in order to, to have this. So, um, I'm still hoping for a third party, which is probably not, may not materialize, but that's, that's what I'm still hoping for. Okay. Um, UPU2408 says, heard that the group ISIS-K has connections in Afghanistan, uh, which would have done the attack in, uh, as a revenge for the Russian war in Afghanistan. I have no idea about that. Um, Charles Voglin says, Professor, please clarify, will banking system be destroyed because of crooks? People in countries will extract their funds not using it. Banking system can only be destroyed. Okay, so what I'm talking about is, look, if, if uh, countries around the world use Western banking systems to keep their money in, and if, okay, so let's say you're from... Um, I don't know, Zimbabwe, I, I don't know, I'm just making something up. And you put money in your Swiss bank and your British bank and the American bank, you know, it's a safe place to put money that's not going to go away, like in Zimbabwe, right? I mean, <laughs> is it Zimbabwe with the Quacha, which has like the worst, had for years had the worst inflation in the world. I, I'm trying to remember where the Quacha was. Um, at any rate, so it's a safe place to put your, your, your money. But if you're looking at it going, uh oh, if I get into a war with uh, powers that the West doesn't like, they're going to seize my money and take it. And I'm not going to like it will hurt the banking system. So uh, Zimbabwe is a little bit out there. But generally speaking, you don't want to do that. You want to still see it as a safe place. Uh, and so that's what I mean. I don't mean just in a normal theft. I mean that it's, it'll be theft based on political um who, who's at odds with those that uh, run the banking system? Um, so as a sod turns landscape and design, it says, uh, unfortunately, well, that's great advertisement. Um, unfortunately, we keep looking at these things from afar and taking a step back. Maybe we should go to Ukraine graveyards and get a perspective 
from these Ukrainian families. Yeah, if you want to get really great perspective, go to at Greg Terry Experience. Um, Greg is uh, on the ground there right now. I mean, like I was like seriously nervous for him the other day. Uh, just like he's he's in very close to harm's way um, very often. So uh, you you'll get to see front you know firsthand what's what's going on very close to the action and talking to people who have been in the action. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a sobering thing to, to spend time over there. Um, okay. W which topic do you most want to talk more uh, about? Like, what is it? Marjorie Taylor green? Is it uh, Moscow? Is it oil refineries? What, what else is, is, uh, grabbing your attention? Uh, I wonder how the professor feels about shopping local Ukrainian business. Does it help the population over there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I, I don't have any issues with that. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if it's triple the cost, but if you can get, you know, something for a reasonably something and you can help the local population, uh, the local economy by buying there. Sure. I mean, that's, that's not a bad idea. Uh, Greg was in Kharkiv, my hometown, still waiting to hear from my father-in-law. Yeah, Kharkiv was getting smashed. He, he counted 23 uh, hits. I think it was 23. might have been 21. 20, more than 20 hits overnight two nights ago while he was in Kharkiv. And so, yeah. Um, Ronald Hooper says, uh, what makes USA think that they can order Ukraine how to operate the war against Russia after refusing to give them promised arms? So, uh, again, we don't know that our, uh, the, our uh, Financial Times article was um, legit, but it seems like it was. And if it was, that the White House is displeased by that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, who was it, Dmitry? I'm trying to remember. It wasn't Anton Gurashenko. Somebody on Twitter was talking about this. They, they were raging about that. Like, uh, what gives you the right to say that? I, I agree. If I was Ukrainian, I'd be like, you know what? <laughs> give us the stuff. If you give us the stuff, we can listen. But if you don't give us the stuff, I, we've got to prosecute. we got to continue to prosecute this war one way or the other. And hitting the oil refineries is actually really... Uh, big payoff for little effort. It's it's a it's a powerful way of prosecuting the war. Uh, Cheryl, Professor Gertis, how do we Republicans? How do we Republicans? I guess get Republicans to sign the Senate version of this discharge petition. I, yeah, I mean, so right now the best plan to my mind is the Democrat discharge petition because it is, uh, the Republican won't get as much traction. The Democrat one is at a 118 out of 120 something, I think. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, anybody know what, what the number is? It's, it's very close. Uh, it won't get all the Democrats and it'll need some Republican crossover, but once it gets close enough, you might actually be able to get, um, uh, you know, actually get that to have some traction and to get it on the floor. If they get it on the floor, it can actually prevail, I believe. But Mike Johnson's just been in the way the whole time. Um, let's see. Guy says taking, uh, well, hold on. A Alexander says, should we, so the West financial system depend on taking dictators money? Doesn't it, ki does it kill Ukrainians? It's not just dictators money. I'm like, I'm just saying anybody around the world that wants to put their money in a safe place is going to get scared off because of the way that we handle whatever assets are there that are from Russia that aren't even necessarily connected to the Russian government. These, these are maybe some oligarch or something. And I know oligarchs can be connected and that sort of thing. 187. Thank you, uh, Cheryl. 187 Democrats and one Republican. Um, one Republican. You know, it's, it's it's been increasingly hard to to mention my party, even though my my convictions, my principles haven't changed. My party's being stupid. Um, how should we process? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so it's not just dictators' money. It's like you're attacking the wrong thing by stealing the money of the people that have it there. You're not attacking the Russian government head on like you should be. Okay. Um, Anton says, as a Ukrainian, I'm here to listen and try to understand U.S. politics a bit more. Sometimes it looks even crazier than ours with all the crap that we have. It's different. 
And the system works in a particular way. And if you understand the system, you can be a little bit more at ease. But even then, we're just doing some dumb stuff. But the, the system, I like, they're still working through all the means or the mechanisms of the system. So the process came to a dead end here. So now they're trying to, to work the process here. So now they're trying to work the process there. And that could all be up in the air if Marjorie Taylor Greene does put this on the floor and there's enough votes. And then you have, like, they just recessed for two weeks from the House. So nothing will happen in the next two weeks. And then after that, when they do come back, does something go to the floor? And, right, so... Uh, it's it's different, but if you understand the system, it's it makes a little bit more sense. Um, and by the way, the system is designed for gridlock, so that's a good thing, and it's a good thing because like some of you are like, well, if Trump came to power, he would just make this and do that and do the other. Like he's really the president's really limited. Look at what Biden's not been able to actually accomplish because he's waiting on the the Congress, right? And even within the Congress, it's divided and they divided and they subdivided and they divided again for reasons. And that's to prevent tyranny. So while so the president, it might be the most powerful man on earth, but he's actually really limited in what he can do with that power. He can be powerful in the right circumstances. And other times he's got to wait for Congress to act. OK, um, why don't Americans ask nicely to OPEC to pump more oil? They're the ones controlling the prices, not Russian refineries working or not. I'm sure that they're working on that behind the scenes, at trying to get OPEC to do that. But, you know, OPEC's got its own agenda. They're they're not they're neither for America nor for Russia. They're for themselves. And, you know, I mean, if I was Saudi Arabia, I'd, I'd be happy to see it go up with less money coming or with less oil flowing out. Um. Ben says, does the USA have any right? Uh, did Cheryl say something again? Oh, no, she's talking to somebody else. Um, uh, does the USA have any right to ask Ukraine not to hit oil refineries? No, not really. Uh, they aren't if they aren't funding uh, Ukraine anymore, assuming the financial time. No, they, they don't really have a right to, to do that. Like, just <laughs> I, I, you know, I could I could understand if they were saying, look, we're giving you every, every tool, just don't do that because it's going to hurt the you know inflation everywhere else. And it does hurt inflation everywhere else. But the root of that hurting inflation everywhere else is Putin prosecuting a war. It's not that the Ukrainians are trying to survive. So um, I, don't, I don't see that as something that they need to pay attention to or, or really listen to. Um, let's see. Just because others had better character doesn't mean it can't be done. Don't forget I'm not sure what we're talking about with just other character. Um, X Penguin says, uh, as a Brit, I don't understand how the U.S. system lets you add extraneous items onto a bill. It looks very messy. Yeah, so these are amendments. You can add amendments to a bill. You can uh, amend it to take things off. It's just part of the process. Uh, I like watching British um, House of Commons prime minister's questions with the house of commons because they get to like ridicule each other from across the aisle here here and boo and that kind of thing uh that's always a good time uh, that's kind of nerdy i know um okay so guy says america wouldn't have told ukraine what to do and what not to do we can only advise them as there are men who are dying <coughs> well again the the financial times article is the only source that we have and it sounds like they're trying to persuade them very much like please don't do this thing how stringent that is of you're not getting stuff or whatever i mean we're already not getting stuff i, I don't know what else is involved with that um, so other than a single undisclosed source in the times article, it was actually, the, yeah, the financial times, uh, has there been any credible information? Please don't attack refineries. I haven't seen it yet. And that's really the trick. So we don't know. I mean, for all we know, the source could be Russian planted. I, I just, I, I have no idea. Um, yeah. So, uh, Saudis in financial stress with their green poly, uh, projects had to go to U.S. equity markets. I'm not sure what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> Alexander Vladimirov says, you're sounding like a typical current Republican. You're supporting Ukraine in the begging of the sentence, but, uh, but saying, but they cannot use Putin's money. You're misunderstanding me. It's not 
I'm saying they shouldn't destroy the banking system if you remove yourself. And I would say this, I, I said this before the Ukraine war, when I was teaching an economics course and saying, look, what we've done, what, what we did in the Carter administration, what Reagan did when they froze assets was making it un like making it uh, nervous to people around the world who would put their money in there. And that's actually de degradating uh, the system. We shouldn't be doing that. So I've been consistent all the way through. It has nothing to do with Ukraine. It has everything to do with the banking system. You can't just steal from them to give to them. I, I get it. Now, if uh, Ukrainians could uh, roll over the border, break into a bank in Belgorod and loot the money, <laughs> go ahead. That That's not my concern at all. This is time of war. That's, that's the enemy country. That doesn't bother me at one bit. But it's the banking system that is going to uh, be hitting the teeth if we allow that to happen. So you have to be careful with it. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Scott Wagoner says, people seem to be missing the big story behind the refineries. Russia lacks the airborne. Yes, 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 yes. Scott, very good. Um, Russia lacks the airborne early warning detection uh, to detect low objects, that's a huge vulnerability that can be easily exploited. Moreover, and I said this a number of places, like if you look at the maps of where the refineries are, they can hit them with drones. And there's no anti-missile defense kind of something around these places. Like Engels Air Base, they tried to hit Engels the other day, three days ago, something like that. They they shot down those drones. Okay. But you don't have those that same air defense around every refinery and until you do have air, uh, that kind of air defense around every refinery they're vulnerable and if and to put that air defense around every defi refinery you'd have to kind of pull it back from ukraine in order to have enough to do that and so they have choices to make do we get this shut down or and you know Solyov was already talking about how um well you know if they can't protect themselves with their own security then we're going to have to nationalize them that's that's the solution so good you're you're onto something pretty significant by the way when i talked about the banking system and don't do this to the banking system i recognize that a lot of you don't agree with me maybe you're here because you want a different perspective this is a different perspective and i think it's a legitimate perspective and i'd, I'd ask you to listen to that and not think well he's just being you know on the side of whatever I'm just telling you, it's it's dangerous to do that for a world order. It's dangerous. OK, just OK. Um, uh, all their fancy was all their fancy long range missiles can't do anything if they don't know a target is inbound. That's that's true. But they don't even have the fancy missiles there, I don't believe. And that's that's really part of the issue. Uh, how are you balancing all your time? Uh, teach YouTube sleep family. I'm not. Uh, I'm very tired and I'm just trying to do do my part uh, to get this kind of material out. Um, I, I've tried to make it as uh, easy on me and effective for you simultaneously as I could. And I found that doing the daily brief and the three big stories on either side is a way of me filtering the news and I try to keep it short. I really do. I mean, the idea was I was going to have a three minute here and a three minute there. <laughs> now that it takes time to prioritize and actually filter through the news in order to, to specify what are those things that are important. But sometimes it just it, like I did five stories and I did five, I stayed in five minutes yesterday. I did five stories because it's hard to distill. Um, so I was doing those. And then if there's some other like oil refineries. I did one just on oil refineries yesterday because that was really important. Of course, that was over, you know, overtaken by everything else that was going on. But um, yeah, but I, I really try. And then, you know, I, I have to shift gears and like do my real job. Uh, and so it's just, I don't get a lot of free time. Okay. Uh, Bun Blunder Boy says, what's your prediction uh, regarding how Putin will respond to the terror attack in Moscow? It seems to me his best course of action is to somehow blame the West and stay the course in Ukraine, deci uh, deciding this is a distraction. He will, in my estimation, and so I thought that initially, because of my framework, my, my framework of reference, all the time that I spend focusing on Ukraine, I thought, oh, is this a false flag? 
That was my first thought. And and I could be wrong. I mean, it could have been something else. Like Putin does have enemies from other places. And that's that's true. Like not everybody in Russia is all has warm fuzzies toward Russia. Um, but he, uh, the West will certainly be blamed in some way, shape or form uh, for allowing or not preventing or uh, working with Ukraine or what. I don't know what exactly it is, um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that there's going to be something. I'm going to look forward to seeing what he has to say with some great interest. Um, so Cheryl's here said, note, uh, Kevin Delaney question, Kevin Delaney. I'm looking for the question, Kevin Delaney, Kevin Delaney, Kevin Delaney, Kevin Delaney. I don't see if you could read. Oh, there it is. Has Zelensky entered into discussions with France and EU nations about entering Ukraine to my knowledge? No. Um, and, uh, or so the French are talking about limited, uh, French boots on the ground in order to do some, not like frontline stuff, but some support activities that could be done there. And um, yeah, so uh, Ronnie says, uh, don't worry about the briefness. Uh, do you look at ATP geopolitics? We love his ranch. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I showed you a little clip of Greg and ATP talking, uh, Johnny talking uh, yesterday in my daily brief because it, um, I, I asked Greg, I said, I had a text from Greg and I said, um, about the missile strikes in Kharkiv. I said, Hey, do you mind if I use that? I know that was a private message. I don't want to, you know, assume that I can use it. I said, yes. And I'm uh, just about to talk to Johnny about it on ATP. So I'm going to tell him exactly. And so I use a clip of that as well. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we have to cooperate to graduate, right? We, we should all be working on this, you know, together toward that end. And when I'm highlighting ATP geopolitics, uh, I'm not taking away anything from them saying, here's this little clip, go watch the rest of it. That's, um, yeah, great source. Uh, okay. Scott Wagoner just popped up. Are you still watching Scott Ritter? I was messaging him last night. Always curious to see how he justifies things in his mind. I haven't watched as many so, since he went off YouTube. Uh, I, I, he was banned from YouTube. I, I haven't seen as many things from him, but I like, he pops up on other people's YouTube, um, channels as well. I see him on tweet, uh, tweets and things along these lines. Um, when lots of news overtakes, I have to focus on the other news rather than the repeaters who are saying stupid stuff. Um, uh, Greg is live in the chat. Hello, Greg. Uh, so Greg is going to be on, I think, the Shills tonight. Is that right, Shills? Pop, pop that into the chat so people know um, what it is. And, and don't do it as a, a super chat either. And then I just have to refund you and nobody wins on that. So don't, don't do that. Um, Anthony Watson, but Russia isn't set up for an attack. They never imagined anyone would attack Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, plus don't care about civilian losses. That That's right. They're, they're not, uh, they're not prepared for what has been happening with the oil refineries. And, and that that's quite true. Um, Okay. Professor, do you suppose that Alexander, well, no, that went fast, is right when he says that uh, now Ukraine is buying time at a terrible cost for the West to get its military war? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, they, they have had to play the game very, very differently, pull back, put up defensive lines, um, not uh, so Greg, Greg's here. He can actually tell you all about this as well. Um, he was just talking about this uh, last night on, on Mercado, um, the way that they have to uh, play this game differently and, and pull pull back. And, and where they are is largely a function of they don't have the materials. Um, and it, yeah, it's just, it's, it's bad. Um, now, they will get artillery, but they'll get artillery in like, you know, may june something like that that's that's a problem um but in the meantime they have to play the game differently 
Uh, Ronnie says, what's your explanation for all the sudden big Russian attacks yesterday? It was one of the biggest in the war. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you go back to ATP geopolitics, he talked about this immediately after the section that I talked about using that bit from Greg. Uh, and that is that like they, they used to use these massive, massive, massive Russian missile attacks. And then it kind of calmed down for a while and they had a big one here and then calmed down for a while and big one there. They I don't think they have as many as they had before. And so they use them periodically to overwhelm defenses, but they don't they don't necessarily have enough to be able to constantly do it. So I think it was 34 out of 34 uh, drone attacks last night, if I'm not mistaken. I could I could be wrong about that. It was like 31 out of 31 or something, but it was down to a, a normal level again, not 151 somethings being shot at Ukraine. And when they do that, they're they're doing that for effect. Um, what, uh, Greg, somebody asked, uh, what time uh, Eastern Standard Time are you going to be on the shield? So please answer that in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, we transported 30 Gepards from Jordan. Okay. Um, does Putin fail to switch context between political and military leadership? Uh, huh. He's really not that good of a military leader. He, he's really, he's really like, even as a political leader, he's kind of bad. Like Putin makes most sense. If you think about him as like a mafia Don, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious or making that up, but if you just think about the way that he operates, he, he, he's an authoritarian um, who is using fear in order to keep people in place, but he's also kind of using, um, He's using the carrot and the stick, and he's just kind of keeping everybody happy and working through. And but he's not really some kind of genius tactically or something along these lines. He's not. I, I I'm not sure that I would even call him a military leader. It's just, it's just it's yeah. I think about him like a mafia don, and he makes more sense than anything else in, in my estimation. It I could be wrong. Challenge me if you think I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, in a weird way, Scott Wagner again. It's a weird. Uh, in a weird way, it was refreshing. Russia is finally saving for overwhelming strikes at once. I was starting to wonder if their military leadership ha uh, is from another planet. Yeah, so that they're only striking as they are seems to indicate that they're trying to reserve the number of missiles that they use, or you know, they're they're holding back because they don't have enough from somewhere. Um, so Cheryl says a terror attack simply could have been allowed to happen. So Cheryl, you're you're saying what uh, Anton Garashenko was saying here. Uh, let me go to Anton's tweet, see if I can find that. Because um, he, he was talking about this kind of thing, and I bookmarked it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read this, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, This is there's a, a bit to it. Um, so please forgive me for uh, the delay in getting to your next questions here. He said, uh, some inconsistencies between the official reports and eyewitness accounts in a terrorist attack on the Crocus City Hall. By the way, I, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this is his, his uh, observations. He's a, generally a source that I trust. Uh, I'm, I'm not like conspiracy theorist kind of guy. And I just, I'm, we're trying to piece it together, right? Um, okay, millions of video surveillance cameras are installed in Moscow. At the same time, terrorists armed to the teeth are easily moving around the city in cars with fake license plates. Okay, I don't know about millions, but there's plenty of these. Crocus has a contract with the Okrana Federal State Unitary Enterprise of the National Guard, but the video from the lobby and other rooms where terrorists are shooting people shows no resistance from the guards. That's interesting. There are no guards among the dead or wounded either. That's interesting. I mean, I think if I was going to go do something bad, I would focus on the people that could stop me. Survivors report the guards did not check bags and clothes before entering Crocus and the metal detectors were turned off. That's interesting. Even without uh, taking into account warnings about possible terrorist attacks from foreign embassies. And I understand how they could they could discount that and just say, well, they're, you know, they're just doing that to, um, you know, as a war measure. They're just they're just saber rattling or something. And so that's the one piece that I would like. OK, I'd give Moscow almost a pass on because of that and distrusting 
that okay um ter terrorists leave a, a lead in the form of a car in which they arrive and about which everything else is already known like something seems fishy about that it's reported that the very same renault with terrorists was detained in the Bryansk region on the way to the ukrainian border why didn't the attackers change the car while the whole country was looking for even if they were on the way to ukraine why through Bryansk, where the border zone is maximally fortified and protected it's claimed that the building was set on fire using gasoline from canisters was it really enough for a fire of this magnitude for a building and like i don't want to get like into a place of like, but that couldn't have happened. I, I just, I have no idea, but he's asking some interesting questions. Uh, why are there no signs of automatic fire extinguishing systems working? Um, that could just be corruption, but it could be something and more. Uh, there were, uh, they were checked so thoroughly after the tragedy uh, in the Venetia shopping wall. Uh, Spetsnaz drove for over an hour, even though the OMON military base is eight minutes from Crocus. The firefighters did not put out the fire before Spetsnaz arrived. Um, as if someone was interested in more casualties or the escape of terrorists. At the moment, it's reported that the number of victims of the terrorist attack in Crocus has reached 143 people. Video shows completely collapsed dome of the Crocus City Hall. Okay, so... I don't know. Did they want it to be a bigger thing so that they could blame something? We'll find out what what is being said afterwards. I watched Inside Russia. I watched Kenza. I watched some of Mercado. Um, I watched uh, regular news, um, I, whatever I could get my hands on here to try to understand what's going on. And I don't understand what's going on. Uh, I think we just have to be humble about what our assessments are and just try to piece things together. And, and you have pieces of this puzzle that maybe I don't see either. So, um, so that's, that's where we are with this. It's, it's, it's a terrible tragedy, but again, I like it's, we don't know if it's ISIS, but ISIS did claim it. Hamas condemned ISIS, which is okay. Um, <laughs> it's a very strange thing. You don't know which side to be on. It's a, it's a very, very strange thing. Okay. Uh, Cheryl Whaley said, blew down the line to save U.S. democracy. Okay. Uh, oh, no, that's Art Teague saying that. It's easy to say if you're already blue. It's a lot harder if you're... Uh, conservative and, and still actually hold those particular values. It, it, it's very um, difficult. Okay. So let me, let me do this. So who, who do you root for in uh, with the, in, with this tragedy, Russians or ISIS? <laughs> I mean, like it's a, it's a weird thing to, to think like who, who are the good guys here? There's, I mean, it's, it's hard to see. It's, it's just, okay. At any rate, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but the it's just it's very conflicted it's like the marjorie taylor green and and johnson thing like who who are the good guys and who are the who's the good guy and who's the bad guy here um okay uh rushing response can also be incomplete yes it is um if, uh, effects of decades of kleptocracy that's that's a legitimate point uh, based off the first terrorist interviews, they were held by assistance of a Muslim teacher. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, it, I mean, it's, it gets even more bizarre when I was watching, uh, a little clip from, um, here, this is CIA analyst, uh, Larry Johnson is on with, um, uh, what's his the judge judging freedom, Judge Napolitano, he always has these conspiracy theorist kind of guys on there saying that it was the U.S. behind it. And this this was a U.S. CIA initiated that. Really? I mean, I think that's a I mean, it's possible, but I think it's pretty unlikely that the U.S. is going to risk thermonuclear war over doing that. And for what? I mean, OK, um, so we just but we don't we just don't know. Okay, uh, I'll take a few more questions and then we're going to be done because we're already at 53 minutes. So uh, let's see what, what else we can get out. Cheryl said, simple MGT and Johnson, both are bad guys. Johnson could be lesser of two evils momentarily. So who do you root for, Johnson or Marjorie Taylor Greene? I mean, it, I mean, that's the kind of conflict that we, that we have. And that's the kind of thing with Moscow and a terrorist. That's the kind of thing that I feel when I look at all my values here or except for Ukraine or Ukraine. I'm, I, and I've been supporting Ukraine and I just like, it's not easy for it. It's easy if you're a, a liberal or Democrat to say, just vote blue. It's not easy if you're sitting where I'm sitting. 
Okay. At any rate, let's go back to, and, I, and I'm not advocating that I'm going to vote for Trump because I'm not. Um, and I'm putting that out there before you all go nuts. Um, uh, what does victory look like? It, uh, is it right to have an opinion? Sure. It's right to have an opinion. You should have an opinion. You should have a clear uh, indication of what victory, the end state looks like. To me, the current borders and NATO membership would be better than a longer war. I don't think the West wants total victory for Ukraine. So I don't think Ukrainians want to shed those those regions. Um, and especially with Crimea right there, with the Russians having their, their Navy right there that can always menace them. Um, and even if they're in NATO, do, I mean, the Russian imperial desires seem to be uh, the appetite has been wet for more. And so fighting them now, seem, stopping it while it's small seems to be better than, stop, you know, letting it fester and having it become bigger. But again, we're, different people will have different views on that. And, and they're very split on that. I don't think the West wants total victory for Ukraine, that part of it. I, I don't know. I think there are some factions within the West that, that actually do, um, uh, do want Russia to not be really hurt. I'm not sure. I think you, I got a lot of that vibe from Germany. Um, I don't see that in France anymore. I certainly haven't seen it in Poland, Baltic states, that kind of thing. But I think there are some factions. Certainly, you'd see Hungary is in that category. It seems like FICO in Slovakia is like that. Um, but I think in general... Um, the West wants Ukraine to prevail, but doesn't have the will to see it through. I, I think that's the fairest way. Like, there's not enough there. You'd, you'd almost need a Pearl Harbor kind of moment, and God forbid, I hope that doesn't happen, but uh, you'd almost need something like that in order to wake up those that are sleeping and saying, we have our own problems. We do have our own problems, but we're making it worse by not addressing this. Um. Okay, there's a misconception about mobilization in Ukraine in the West. Mobilization never stopped. It's a continuous process. The thing is that law never changed essentially from Soviet times. Okay, that's fine. They could still be working at it, but they're still lighter than they should be, And as far as I understand. Um, okay, uh, Jake Bro, today Shoigu is building a second military to fight NATO. Well, they are wanting to amp up another 500,000. And what do they need another 500,000 for? I mean, really, that's, that's that seems like a lot. Uh, and where are they going to get those 500,000? That's that's the question. If I was um, a young Russian male, I'd be doing my level best to get out of that place quickly before I become cannon fodder. OK, I'll do uh, three more questions. Any three particular questions, uh, get those out now and then we'll be done. And thank you all for asking intelligent questions and helping us understand and and uh, adding context. I, I really appreciate that. And thank you. A bunch of hearts just popped up. Thank you for the likes that you put on here because that'll help spread the uh, I know there are 484 of you in here watching right now. And um, when you hit that like button, that that tells YouTube to go see see this. Some people want to see this. So thank you very much for that. Um 1992 borders for Ukraine reparations from Russia uh, for victims of Russian fascism. And I, there wasn't a question there. Um, man, you're going quick here. Ben Fowler, is it going, it's going to happen, but we need to start preparing now. Uh, I, was there a question or a statement? Ah, Cheryl, um, my Republican evangelical family member said Haley is boring. Yeah, Trump is fun and exciting. They get off on watching him get away with things. So there's something very right about that. Um, I did this one video, which was a little clip from my class, where he talked about an article from Critical Sociology that was about the, the fusion of populism and isolationism in Trump. And when Trump says stuff that's inflammatory and you think, how could a politician survive saying that? That's not a bug. It's a feature because the people that feel disenfranchised on the right side of the spectrum because everything became about identity politics and they feel left out of whatever is happening in society for one reason or another. They feel this. They want Trump to go punch the other side in the mouth because they can't. That's, I think, a, a pretty simplistic way, but a, a fair way of saying, yep, that's 
That's what's why Trump is Trump. That's why he has the the sustaining power that he has, because there are people that are feeling bad, feeling beat down, feeling overlooked, feeling out of place, whatever, as within culture and society. And they want Trump to go and be their their reaper for them. Um, so I think your analysis is spot on. Do you think Trump is victimized and the and well, hold on, and the state is doing things to him that they have not done to other leaders? I think not me personally, but I think Republicans writ large, especially MAGA Republicans, believe that. I think it's a little weird that they went after some of the lawsuits that they went after. Uh, he did it to himself with the E. Jean Carroll case. But the New York case, the one that um, was going after him for a loan, it it is a pretty potent argument that where was the when you ask where what was the crime well, who who was hurt because the bank got their money he got his everybody won and there was no nobody was complaining about it except for the attorney general the inflation of uh, inflated uh, estimates of of, of uh, his properties or something that case it's weird it was like they were going after the person rather than the crime and it was it was strange um and so that one makes me a little squ uh, uh squirrely stormy daniels that was just stupid he shot himself in the foot <laughs> like so so there's different levels so you can't just say which one you have to be specific about which one but it there's a palpable sentiment on the right side of the political spectrum that's that feels like he is being politically persecuted and that feeling is actually driving them to adhere to Trump even more. Okay. Last question. Let's see if I can find the last question. Um, Anton says it would be interesting to talk about political systems and how they are exploited by populist rhetoric. Well, they are being exploited by populist rhetoric. Um, somehow people are still thinking about presidents like Kings. And I think it's a problem. It is a problem. And, and that, that populism is spread like wildfire through social media as well. And, um, whether you have facts or, or don't have facts, people say things and then they just act like, oh, well, that, that must be the case. Cause I saw somebody say this, um, when you're, when you're on Twitter, if people say things, always discount it unless you see the source involved. Like you can see a picture, but unless it goes actually to the source and you can link through and see what the source is saying, just, just be careful with that. Okay. That's my hour. Thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me the thumbs up that those of you who have given me likes, thank you for that. I appreciate it for the algorithm. Um, thank you for thinking through this with me. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I, I hope that helped you this, this hour that we spent together. All right. Uh, have a good one. I'll be back for my three big stories later on the day. I might do a Marjorie Taylor Greene one just for fun, just to go through what she has to say and stop and say, okay, this is why she's doing that, or this is why she's doing this. And here's what this will probably lead to. Uh, I might do that between that. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.